Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren, and sisters. We're going to have all of you along with us here with our Temperance Awakening and our 12th Tobacco Lecture. And I know, as we uh, previously met, we said that our lecture today was going to go over, like, uh, tobacco and medications and how uh, medications and tobacco mixing can cause some problems. But we're actually going to take another turn here. We're going to be looking at a... Uh, at some of the at some of the exposing that was done um, to tobacco companies back during the 90s and like all the way up until uh, you know the time that the FDA was given authority over the tobacco industry and so that's what we're going to be looking at to here today and uh, so we do apologize if you were kind of looking forward to tobacco and uh, medication but we're going to do that next week though we'll get back on a regular schedule uh, next week, but we want to uh, cover this. Go ahead and cover this here uh, here this week. <clears throat> and so a lot of this started on May 12, 1994. There was a box filled with 4,000 pages of secret internal documents from the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation uh, that appeared on the desk of Professor Stoughton Glantz. Uh, Professor Stoughton Glantz, who works in the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of California, San Francisco. And it's quite interesting, uh, humorous, I guess we could say. Now, the return address read only Mr. Butts. That's all it said. And uh, these documents contain proof of what anti-smoking activists had long suspected, you know, since the 50s, 60s, and maybe even before that, that tobacco companies were intentionally withholding information from the public and the scientific community concerning the harmful effects of tobacco. And uh, Professor Glantz and his colleagues analyzed the thousands of pages of documents, and at last, they made public their report in a book titled The Cigarette Papers, which they say contains, and I quote, Overwhelming evidence of the irresponsible and deceptive manner in which BMW, BMW is short for Brown and Williamson, has uh, conducted its tobacco business for more than 30 years, BMW had been well aware of the addictive nature of cigarettes, and in the course of those years, it has also learned of numerous health dangers of smoking. Yet, throughout this period, it chose to protect its business interests instead of the public health by consistently denying any such knowledge and by hiding adverse scientific evidence from the government and the public using a wide assortment of scientific, legal, and political techniques. The documents also demonstrate that BMW's conduct was representative of the tobacco industry generally. BMW acted in concert with other domestic tobacco companies on numerous projects, the most important of which were specifically designed to prevent or at least delay public knowledge of the health dangers of smoking and protect the tobacco companies from liability if that knowledge became public. And so now we're just going to briefly look at what they call the Big Six. These are the biggest six uh, tobacco companies in the United States. And uh, Brown & Williamson, who, were, who we were just discussing there, they're the third largest tobacco producer. And they are owned by British American Tobacco, which is a you know worldwide tobacco company, the second largest worldwide tobacco company. And BMW controls approximately 11% of cigarette sales in the United States. Uh, they rank behind R.J. Reynolds, which is the second biggest at 28%, and then Philip Morris, which is the biggest, at 43%. These three, and then three other smaller to American tobacco companies, earn approximately $45 billion a year. And out of those earnings, in a recent bad year, uh, the Big Six showed a combined profit of $5.2 billion. And that is actually just from U.S. sales, doesn't include the sales that they also made in other countries. <clears throat> and as we said there, Philip Morris is the uh, biggest tobacco company. It began producing cigarettes in London in 1854, and today manufactures the, wor manufactures the world's largest uh, selling cigarette, which is Marlboro. And then... Uh, in some 25 countries, Philip Morris controls at least 15% of the cigarette market, and uh, they also produce uh, a few other brands, uh, those being Benson & Hedges, Merritt, Virginia, Slims, and Players. And then, as we said, after Philip Morris' R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, that was founded by R Richard Joshua Reynolds in 1874 as a maker of chewing tobacco, and uh, that back when... Uh, 
when a tobacco, the chewing tobacco, you know, was the most popular form of tobacco before cigarettes were, was really popular. And by 1887, uh, from its factory in Winston Salem in Winston, North Carolina, uh, Reynolds was uh, was was uh, marketing 86 brands of chewing tobacco. Then in the early 1900s, uh, responding to an increasing demand for cigarettes, Reynolds developed Camel, the Camel cigarette, which is uh, packaged. Uh, which was initially packaged with a picture of a circus animal. I think still today that actually has that. It's like a, a like a cartoony type camel that's on the front of the pack. <clears throat> and a camel is uh, is particularly a favorite of youth, of younger people, uh, you know, like teenagers and uh, like people through their like mid twenties. And it's uh, the, probably the strongest selling RJR cigarette. And RJR also produces Winston, you know, which is a pretty popular for a long time. Uh, they sponsored a NASCAR, the NASCAR Cup Series, and then also Salem and Doral, uh, which are also fairly popular. Then they also produce Vantage, as well as a couple of other uh, cigarette brands, which are not as popular. <clears throat> and uh, Brown and Williamson, as we said, which are the third, which is the third largest tobacco company. Uh, they are owned by the British American Tobacco Company, which, we, as we said, was a uh, uh, which was a uh, which is a worldwide a worldwide tobacco company and uh, through British American Tobacco's acquiring of Brown and Williamson Brown and Williamson was relatively small was very small in 1927 when they were first bought by the British American Tobacco Company but the British American Tobacco Company made them a uh, made them a much bigger brand and as we said they turned them into the number three player in the American tobacco game and uh, B&W's biggest selling cigarettes are Cool, Richland, and Capri. And then behind BMW are American Brands and Lorillard. They they both hold about seven percent of the uh, cigarette market. And uh, American Brands doesn't have a cigarette on the top ten American list, but they do produce uh, some brands that are relatively popular. Those being Carlton, Terryton, Lucky Strike, and Pall Mall. And then Lorillard manufactures the number five cigarette in the United States, Newport. And then the last one, the uh, sixth biggest uh, of these big six, is Liggett and Myers, which controls about 2% of the American cigarette market. And the most popular brands that they produce are LMN and also the Eve cigarette. And now we're going to look at uh, tobacco being an American habit, because uh, it is a plant that is native to North America. And uh, it was uh, named by the natives who met Christopher Columbus when he arrived on the continent. Using a long wooden tube, which they called a tobacco, these people inhaled uh, through their noses uh, smoke from the leaves of a species plant called Nicotiana. And alternately, they rolled the dry Nicotiana leaves in corn husk and inhaled the smoke through their mouths. And uh, within a hundred years, the tobacco habit had spread to Europe and from there to the rest of the world. And uh, the first cigarettes were harsh tasting, which is why they were not very popular. Some people did that, but like uh, chewing tobacco and like snuff, you know, were more popular than cigarettes back, uh, you know, throughout the or throughout really all throughout until the early uh, until the early 20th century. And uh, these things were harsh tasting, and uh, you know, people didn't like you know the bitter jolts of nicotine that they received upon inhaling. And then it was actually John Rolfe, the English colonist who settled in what is now known as the state of Virginia. He's actually the fellow who married the very popular Native American lady Pocahontas, uh, you know, which is still a very popular story. And uh, he responded to the need for a more pleasant cigarette by perfecting a milder tobacco. And for 300 years, people smoked or chewed pure tobacco. But then in, uh, by about 1950, in response to the increasing health worries associated with smoking, manufacturers began smoking tobacco, soaking tobacco leaves in additives and turning out filtered cigarettes to create what they claimed was a safer product. And then at the same time, like back to the 50s, their marketing departments were luring an entirely new group of smokers, that being teenagers. And by the mid to late 1960s, their success was apparent. The greatest increase in smokers was in the 16 to 18 year old age department. And then uh, they had like a marketing, which I believe we've already mentioned some of this. They had marketing campaigns like with the Marlboro Man. Uh, he soared in popularity among high school and college and uh, college age males. 
and a Lucky Strike also began a teen campaign based on the slogan, Lucky separate the men from the boys, but not from the girls. And then for young ladies, Philip Morris introduced Virginia Slim cigarettes in 1967, and within six years the number of teenage girls who smoked had doubled. And other manufacturers followed this uh, theme, like targeting females with the brands Eves, Silva Thins, and other and some other ladies' brands. And of the tobacco industry in denial, you know, as they uh, still are, you know, to some extent, even though they've been exposed a lot. But especially though, you know, through the uh, '90s, they were very, very much in denial. <clears throat> And uh, throughout their campaigns to attract teen smokers, American cigarette companies made no acknowledgement of tobacco's harmful effects. You know, yet since the early years of the uh, 19th of the 20th century, uh, when smoking first became popular, tobacco companies had suspected the dangers. And this is actually written in a book called *The Gilded Leaf*. And this was actually written by, of all people, um. Uh, Patrick Reynolds, who is actually the grandson of R.J. Reynolds, you know, who started the very popular R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. Although Patrick Reynolds, though, was not pro-tobacco. He was very anti-tobacco. Hence him writing this book. And he even exposed a lot of this as well in this book. He said, for many years before 1911, before 1911, like that's again, so that was even long before, you know, like the 50s, whenever people first started suspecting the health dangers of smoking. But for many years, even before 1911, uh, Patrick Reynolds writes about his grandfather, R.J. He says, R.J. had believed cigarettes were harmful to health, in particular that the paper wrapper caused problems when it burned. Others in the company thought this was nonsense and cited the public's obvious appetite for cigarettes as reason enough to manufacture them. You know, it can make some money. You know, even if it does kill people, I still make money off of it. And, you know, the practice of just giving the public what it wants, regardless of all the, you know, regardless of all the health problems, has dominated the thinking of tobacco companies throughout the years. And, you know, they've just always wanted to make money regardless of the health effects of it. And now, like a Philip J. Hiltz, he wrote in the book called The Smoke Screen, uh, he wrote that in the 1940s, industry representatives ordered tests to, dis to determine the toxicity of tobacco smoke and the level of irritation created by the TARS. And one scientist test involved putting a single drop of the extract in rabbit's eyes. And uh, Philip Hiltz wrote about that, about that scientist doing that test. He said he had to stop the project after finding that a single drop, just one single drop, was so toxic that it caused massive sores and the complete loss of the eye. He said it was the most toxic substance he had ever seen. And that was in the 1940s, yet, you know, that was never given to the public until the 1990s. And uh, so now some people were, you know, taking drastic action when they found out about this. And now uh, the results of these tests were reported to tobacco companies, but it took another decade before signs of danger began to reach public awareness. You know, another decade, you know, that being the 50s after the 1940s. Uh, like Reader's Digest... Uh, which is today an openly anti-smoking magazine, ran its first critical article in 1952 titled Cancer by the Card, and we may have already mentioned that in some previous lectures. But uh, a year later, a report in the journal Cancer Research telling of the, of the uh, tumor-producing effects of smoke condensate made its way into national newspapers. The public began to worry, and tobacco executives huddled for a crisis meeting in New York. The reports they acknowledged were extremely serious and worthy of drastic action. Quickly, the companies launched, mass, launched massive public relations campaigns to offset the disturbing news coming from the research labs. They formed the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, TARC, which we've mentioned, I, I do believe, a couple of times. They claim uh, that, uh, that TARC was to be a neutral organization, you know, that isn't for tobacco or against it. Uh, but, um, but it was definitely, though... Uh, you know, for tobacco companies, you know, they were, you know, they were, it was organized and paid for by tobacco companies. So just their main purpose was to counterclaim that tobacco was, use was hazardous to human health. You know, to counterclaim that, saying that there was nothing wrong with it. And a TARC supposedly launched its own studies, but it reported none of the harmful conclusion that its scientists found. And their advertising tobacco companies began to downplay the stress-relieving benefits of smoking, fearing that critics might now use such claims to support the charge that tobacco is addictive. And then by the early 1960s, scientists identified 
uh, the most harmful properties in tobacco smoke, and their reports at last prompted the government to take a stand. And then in 1964, a uh, surgeon uh, general at that time announced a link between smoking and lung cancer. And uh, two years later, every package of cigarettes was required to carry a warning label, and by 1971, cigarette ads had been banned from television and radio. And as more data was revealed, non-smokers became vocal about the danger they perceived in secondhand smoke. Even though there was not yet enough proof of this danger, people started demanding smoke-free workplaces and non-smoking sections in restaurants and other public areas. And uh, their efforts, of course, paid off starting in 1975. Uh, with uh, with some laws being uh, started there in Minnesota, and of course now that's all over the country, uh, where we have uh, most of you know our public places and all are all smoke free. And now looking at some of the more exposing that was done to tobacco companies. The scientific revelations were accompanied by a greater public demand for the truth from tobacco companies about the nature of their products. But the company steadfastly thwarted such requests by. Re by uh, refusing to reveal their internal documents, their research, or other findings on which policy was based. The company's top executives continued to claim that there was no positive proof that smoking caused cancer or heart disease. They maintained that smoking was not addictive and that people chose to smoke of their own free will. They further insisted that they were committed to determining the scientific truth about the health effects of tobacco, both by conducting internal research and by funding external research. And, of course, as we mentioned from the beginning, the insincerity of these claims were exposed in 1994 whenever Professor Glantz and his colleagues made public the uh, Brown and Williamson documents that had been supplied by somebody anonymous who was just known as Mr. Butts. And the tremendous fur and upheaval that followed resulted in an investigation by the FDA, <clears throat> that being the Food and Drug Administration, and lawsuits were fought against the major tobacco companies. The BNW reports deny that manufacturers manipulated nicotine levels to keep smokers addicted. However, they did state that most are adding chemicals such as ammonia to increase the potency in cigarettes, ammonia being a chemical that spurs the delivery of nicotine to the body. And then there were a flood of lawsuits as well. In addition to this evidence, a former BMW executive accused his boss of lying to Congress by claiming he did not believe nicotine was addictive. Furthermore, said the former executive, company lawyers hid potentially damaging scientific research and the company continued to add chemicals to cigarette mixtures even after being informed that the chemicals were unsafe. And then these disclosures brought another flood of lawsuits by individuals and families whose health had been damaged by smoking. Fearing that agreeing to out-of-court settlements would imply guilt, the company steadfastly refused to settle, uh, spending whatever it took to win their cases. And since most of these individuals, you know, were only at best, you know, middle-class people, they couldn't financially, you know, they just couldn't financially, you know, battle the mighty corporations and the tobacco companies won the cases. And following the initial lawsuits, a new round of litigation began. Class action suits where hundreds of smokers, former smokers and family members of people who passed away from, you know, cancer related to smoking and tobacco united to fight the tobacco companies. And showing a confidence based on past successes, Philip Morris executive Jeffrey Bible, what a bad last name he has to work for a tobacco company, announced, we expect to prevail in all the class action suits and underlying claims. He added, with some typical self-assurance, you must remember we have never lost a case. But finally they did lose some. And then now summing up the things, uh, the uh, lecture today, we have the FDA rule. In all of these class action suits, the increasing public outcry and the ongoing health revelations of the 1990s at last prompted action by the FDA and the federal government. See, so far, tobacco had been exempt from FDA regulations, for it was considered neither a food nor a drug. Additionally, it had been on the market so long that it had grandfather status, which protected it from regulation. And uh, like uh, somebody who uh, wrote for the Wall Street Journal, uh, like wrote something uh, kind of humorous, but also very sad. He said, a product believed to be responsible for 425,000 deaths each year got less government oversight of its contents and marketing than did ice cream. And the FDA Commissioner David Kessler uh, was also very outraged by tobacco's impact on young people, and he said... This epidemic of youth addiction has enormous public consequences. A casual decision at a young age to use tobacco products leads all too often to addiction, serious disease, and premature death as an adult. 
Now, then, uh, the FDA responded by drawing up rules to govern the manufacture and sell of tobacco products, particularly as they affected young people. Among the proposed, proposed provisions were bans on cigarette sales through vending machines, self-service displays, and the distribution of free samples. The FDA wanted to end sponsorship of sporting events by tobacco companies and the printing of tobacco brand names on clothing or other products attractive to teenagers. And no tobacco ads were to appear within 1,000 feet of schools. All outdoor ads and those in teen publications must be text only and run in black and white. The FDA proposed that retailers be required to verify the ages of any tobacco purchasers who appear, who appear to be under the age of 27. The FDA rule was approved by President Bill Clinton on August 23, 1996. Like the former Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett Koop, uh, shortly said before its approval, the tobacco companies are clearly adversaries not only of the public health community, but also of the very health and life of the American people, and we need to make that even clearer. And the goal of the FDA rule, said Clinton, was to reduce youth tobacco consumption by 50% over a seven-year period. The campaign for tobacco-free kids called it the first meaningful national policy in history to limit kids' access to tobacco and to prevent the tobacco industry from marketing its deadly products to our children. And then, not surprisingly, the proposed FDA rule was immediately challenged by the tobacco companies, and battles raged well beyond the 1997 date when the regulations were to have taken effect. And in an effort to sway politicians, tobacco interests pumped $4.5 million into the coffers of federal political candidates and national political parties in 1997. Like the New York Times commented, an industry record for a non-election year, but this time money failed to talk as it had in the past. In a twist, uh, the uh, New York Times added, as the industry gives additional money to federal candidates and the national, feder and the national parties, it finds itself with fewer and fewer friends. Although that was, that uh, FDA rule was, you know, finally signed. And uh, do you know what year it was? Just to give you a moment there to try and guess before I tell you. 2009, I believe, June 22nd exactly, was whenever the FDA finally got, uh, got sole authority of overseeing the manufacture and sale of tobacco products. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, you know, the tobacco companies were finally forced to admit that smoking is harmful. And in the future, the exposure of children and young adults to tobacco advertising is almost certain to be severely restricted. There's no more sponsorship of sporting events or the use of cartoon characters such as Joe Camel, which appeals to children. Nicotine will also likely be regulated by the FDA, but the agency's powers will be monitored and subject to various external controls. And as the FDA does, you know, regulate that nicotine, at least to some extent. These complications raise questions as to whether nicotine levels will actually be reduced. One particularly controversial point is that, is, uh, that the tobacco industry's insistence that any settlement, including a provision protecting the companies from further class action suits. An editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association addresses the point, saying the tobacco industry has intentionally designed and marketed addictive, lethal products and deliberately hidden their well-known risk. These actions are morally reprehensible, yet the tobacco makers have the shamelessness to ask to be excused from liability for their informed and deliberate, act and in deliberate actions. How would we respond if the makers of cars knew their gas tanks would explode and their brakes were defective, had hidden these flaws, marketed these, vic marketed these vehicles, lied when caught, and then made a similar request? To allow any industry to continue such acts without restriction would be irresponsible to the extreme. And how true that certainly is. And so thank you there for being with us uh, today. And it is good to uh, be able to, you know, lecture this, teach about it, about how these companies were exposed. You know, and that's why we do this, uh, because uh, it's very harmful. And, you know, the people who make these, who uh, make tobacco are immoral people. You know, just plain and simple, point blank. Well, that sounds kind of ugly or self-righteous. Not self-righteous. It's just the truth, amen. It's just the truth. So, uh, but thank you, though, so much for being with us. And a lot of good stuff there that we can learn uh, from uh that uh, we can learn there uh, from looking over uh, these documents and reading these things here. And so we look forward to seeing you the next time right here with Temperance Awakening as we do get into our next tobacco lecture, which will be, uh, we'll be discussing medications and how they are whenever they're mixed with tobacco. So we'll see you then. So the day breaks and the shadows flee away. I am Brother Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.